Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Vantage Seminar for Fall 2021. And we're uh, so happy to be um, returning for this series of talks, which is about Bailey Maps and Hurwitz Spaces. So we have a great lineup of, of speakers for this series, and we're going to start today with uh, John Voigt, who will be speaking on Bailey Maps and Number Theory, a survey. Uh, and John, is it all right for us to um, video this talk? Of course, yes. Okay, take it away. Oh, and one more thing is uh, feel free to put questions in the chat, and then there is going to be a discussion question time halfway through the halfway through the talk. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Drew, for organizing. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for joining me today. It's nice to see all of you. I hope you're having a uh, productive and pleasant August, or if you watch this later, whatever month that is. Uh, th this is uh, the first talk in a series on, on belly maps. And so my goal today is really to provide a survey. So the two halves are uh, an introduction to belly maps, setting terminology, motivating them. And then the second half will show you like my uh, favorite ways in which belly maps arise naturally, what they're good for, um, focused on examples to, to try to sell you on, uh, on, on their beauty and splendor in, in some broad sense. Um, so I hope uh, Drew will probably drop the slides, a link to the slides in a second here. Um, the slides are clickable. So uh, I put some papers and other links there if you want to follow some of those threads. And like Rachel said, feel free to put questions in the chat. I probably won't get to them until, until the break. Okay, so um, I guess this is a number theory and arithmetic geometry seminar. So I thought I would start with just branched covers of the projective line and the riemann hurwitz formula. So I guess all of, even Riemann and Hurwitz, and if you click this link, you'll see uh, an article by Franz Ort that discusses some of the history of this. It's really kind of a fundamental way of understanding Riemann surfaces and branched covers. You can think about it as pulling back the Euler characteristic and the failure of that to, to be simply defined, V minus E plus F way of thinking about it. But I guess in an arithmetic geometry seminar, we think about it like this. Um, let's work over C for a second. So let X be a nice curve, so uh, smooth geometrically uh, integral uh, over C. And let's say that the genus of that curve is G. And we want to consider a, a map. So maps for me are non-constant morphisms uh, to, to P1, and D will be the degree of that map. Okay, so then you can record the genus of X from the degree of the map and how ramified the map is. And the ramification is just uh, the failure for there to be a unique point, um, a D distinct points, let's say, um, above a given point on P1. So that's the total ramification degree. And uh, all right, so what kind of branch covers are there of P1? It's sort of, uh, of all the varieties out there, you might try to map them to projective space. In this case, we're taking curves, which may be quite a complicated and nonlinear. We're just mapping them to P1 and trying to understand them through that lens. All right, so how simple or complicated could that map be? Well, if uh, phi is ramified at R points, R is a non-negative integer, then I don't know, in the simplest possible case, you could just have zero or one ramification points. And this is a little exercise I think uh, everyone should do. You probably have done it yourself. Um, when you plug into the formula and measure how, how big the ramification divisor could be, what you find is that if it's ramified at only zero or one points, in fact, it couldn't be ramified at all. The degree is one and phi is an isomorphism from P1 to P1. If it's ramified at two points, then actually the genus still has to be zero. And the map is just the dth powering map with respect to some coordinate X um, on your necessarily your curve X, which is isomorphic to P1. There the ramification points are zero and infinity. Okay, does that look pretty simple enough? That's how we all start. And then all of a sudden, if you ask or allow it to be ramified at three points, well, you see all of math. Suddenly, it's sort of a, a complete phase transition from utterly trivial maps to, well, basically everything. So let's spend the rest of today studying covers of P1 that are branched at three points. Okay, we're going to see all of math. So let X uh, forevermore be a nice curve over C. Um, a belly map 
on X is a non-constant morphism, uh, X to P1, that is unramified away from 0, 1, and infinity. So the reason we uh, designate and mark the point 0, 1, and infinity is because um, up to a Mobius transformation or projective linear transformation, you can take those three ramification points and put them in any other three ramification points. And so we really don't want right now to consider the additional changes of variables that occur on that P1. We want to mark those three points on the base. Okay. So to be really specific about that, I'm going to say an isomorphism of belly maps is a commutative diagram like this. So you really do have to, uh, the stuff that's ramified above zero, one, and infinity also has to be the same one on the target curve. So that is a certain kind of rigidification and gives you a nice category of belly maps. Um, I will explain in a couple of slides why they're called belly maps, but at least I would like you to introduce uh, belly, have, give him a chance to introduce himself. Um, here, as you could see, we uh, just celebrated 70 years, uh, his birthday in April. Happy birthday, belly. And 20 years ago, um, his passage. And uh, well, these maps are named after him because of a theorem, uh, an important theorem that he proved about them. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's belly maps. Um, let me show you an example. So the simplest uh, kinds of belly maps are just where the source curve X is also isomorphic to P1. So here's, uh, well, my favorite belly map, 2X cubed plus 3X squared. Um, one of the reasons I like this one is that it feels like the coefficients two and three swap from exponents uh, to, the, uh, to their constant terms. And that's uh, an easy way to remember this cubic map. Okay, so what do you get from this? This is a degree three map. Generically, if I tell you the value of phi of x, you'll be able to find three values x that, that give you that, that value. Except, um, for example, at zero, if you ask what values um, do I plug in to get zero, actually x occurs with multiplicity two. This is the ramification. Uh, similarly, if you say, what, when do I get the value one, uh, you subtract one and you find again a, a double root. And in fact, up to a uh, choice of coordinate, there is a unique cubic polynomial with the property that it has a double root at zero. And when you subtract one, it has a double root. So this is sort of the unique such polynomial. And it cannot be ramified anywhere else. That, that follows from the riemann hurwitz formula, but you can really see the belly in the belly map here by saying, well, what would it mean to have a double root? Well, it have to be a root of the derivative and the original polynomial, but the derivative here is uh, factors of six x, x plus one. So it really can't be ramified anywhere else, only zero, one and infinity. So that's what belly maps look like. Um, sort of it's magical that it has this, uh, it factors nicely. And when you subtract one, it factors nicely. Um, and of course, if it's not the polynomial and instead a rational function, then the denominator also factors nicely. Okay, and then to really drive home what belly maps look like, here's a picture, I guess, of what branched covers look like. Um, we have to imagine the projective line as actually being maybe the complex numbers or something two-dimensional. Um, but above, uh, there are sort of three, generically three sheets above, above P1. Uh, we can't really see what's happening above infinity, so ignore it. Above zero and one, you see these sheets uh, coming together at zero and at minus one. And uh, I don't know, you have to imagine this being the natural two to one uh, Z goes to Z squared map locally there. So that's why, I don't know, if you're skating around on this park, if you're on the purple, on the gray sheet, you end up on the blue sheet. And then when you skate back around on the blue one, you end up back at the purple. That's how those, those two sheets come together. So this is really connected. I just sliced the, the P1 and organized the sheets this way, but I hope you'll keep that picture in mind as to how we, well, this is at least how I visualize the, the, what belly maps look like. Okay, um, I wanna give you two other immediate and really fun examples that uh, have a bit more content. Uh, here, there's a, a5 is naturally a subgroup of, of PGL2C. So you can have that act on P1 as a finite subgroup and consider the quotient map. So this is a way of visualing the quotient map that goes back to, uh, I, I stole it out of Magnus, um, where you're supposed to really see the icosahedron and its triangulation. And isn't this a beautiful map? Um, I mean, it's not, you could write down anything that's beautiful and factor the numerator and denominator, but if you subtract one, the numerator is a square on the nose, sort of a remarkable synchronicity of uh, numbers, integers, and uh, polynomials that factor in a nice way. So this is uh, as big as they get, I guess, if you want to talk about um, spherical such maps. 
And it wouldn't be a talk in an arithmetic geometry seminar unless we mentioned the Fermat curve. Um, one of the themes that will emerge in the second half is that uh, belly maps allow us to see distinguished or interesting curves in a natural way. And the Fermat curve also has a belly map of degree n. You just take the powers of these coefficients, and it's a really fun exercise to see that this is branched only above 0, 1, and infinity. OK, so with those uh, examples in mind, let me tell you the theorem of Bellyi, which uh, explains the naming. So. Uh, Here's the theorem, which is was celebrated, and we will celebrate it uh, as well. Um, here's how it goes. A, a nice curve x over c. You might ask the question, hello, curve x. Um, do you admit a belly map? So that means that I can write down a, a meromorphic function on x, which only uh, is ramified above 0, 1, infinity. So for any other value, I have d distinct uh, roots of that uh, rational function. So under what conditions does a belly map exist on X? So the completely confusing thing is that happens if and only if X can be defined over a number field K. How could that possibly be that a geometric property such as having a map is related to the property of being able to be defined by equations over a number field? Isn't that bizarre? Um, that's why we, uh, we call them belly maps um, in his honor, because it's a, an extraordinary, mysterious, wonderful thing. So let me tell you uh, in a very elliptical way how to prove this. Um, so first, uh, if you have a belly map, you are defined over a number field, basically because of Vey descent. The defining data that says that you're a belly map is rigid somehow doesn't deform in a smooth way. And because of that, you don't have pi's and e's and other transcendental quantities up to isomorphism. Uh, and Vey descent gives you the uh, language that allows you to ensure that that really has to, the automorphism group of C has to factor through a sub a finite index sub. In the other direction, um, this is where Belly's uh, contribution came in. Uh, roughly speaking, how do you make a belly map? Well, first you just take your X and map it to P1 using any non-constant function. So those exist uh, by Riemann existence. Now it's ramified at a bunch of rando points in the algebraic numbers. What you do is you postcompose with some function, basically like the minimal polynomial of those roots in order to ensure that the ramification set belongs to P1 of Q. So now it's only ramified at rational numbers. And then somehow all of the magic is in this map. So X goes to this uh, wonderful, mysterious quantity involving X and one minus X. And the significant property of it is that it maps zero, one, infinity in this rational number to zero, one, and infinity. So by further post-composing, you can ensure all the rational numbers end up eventually just at zero, one, and infinity. And in this way, Bellius theorem is really constructive somehow. It tells you how to build a Bellius map. May not be the simplest one in any sense, but uh, um, I hope I've given you a good sense of, uh, we just proved it more or less. I mean, subject to details and checking properties of maps, that's, uh, that's how you do it. Okay, so speaking of mysterious, I, I love this quote of Growth and Deek. So um, in his uh, sketch of a program, uh, I guess people call this the best on, most uh, mathematically profound, unfunded to grant application, something like that. Um, so uh, I put the full quote in here in gray if you want to, if you want to read it. Um, I'm gonna focus on just these few lines. So which are the algebraic curves over Q, the algebraic closure of Q obtained in this way? Do we obtain them all? Who knows? So this is the question, which curves admit a belly map? Less than a year later at the International Congress in Helsinki, the Soviet mathematician Belly announced exactly that result, that all of them, of the ones over number fields, are obtained in such a way. And his concluding sentence is, never without a doubt was such a deep and disconcerting result proved in so few lines. I think that still remains true. How could it be that we could understand the algebraic numbers inside the complex numbers, really distinguishing the transcendental from the algebraic using this geometric property of a curve. And shouldn't it be hard to prove something like that? Um, the answer is it's true and no, it's not hard. Um, so now what do we do? Well, let's, uh, let's study belly maps further, I think is what we should do. Um, there's, uh, 
an even more simplified version of how to understand value maps that is not geometric, but it is topological and then combinatorial. So we will sort of keep track of just where what happens with zero and one, and then we will also encode that in a combinatorial way. And somehow this will uh, hammer home a uh, growth and Deke's comment that uh, this really is a deep and disconcerting way to understand, uh, understand the algebraic numbers. So this is in the language of Desain. So if you have a Bellier map X to P1, thinking about X maybe now as a Riemann surface, um, what you can do is take the pre-image of the closed interval, real interval from zero to one, and just pull it back to the surface X. Can, can you imagine drawing that on your Riemann surface? Uh, maybe just think about P1 for a second and pull back uh, uh, this closed interval. You'll end up with drawing some lines um, on, on your Riemann surface. So we call this a design. So it, it's, it's more than just a, a pre-image. It's a connected bicolored graph. So why is it bicolored? Well, we could label the pre-images of zero and one with different colors. And the edges will have vertices, one of them colored with the same color we do zero and one of them colored one. So usually those are taken to be black and white. Um, and it's, it's connected because we'll assume X is nice and therefore connected. Um, and the, so the, I just said that bicolored means two vertices of an edge are colored differently. And then there's one other property, which uh, is that when you draw something on a Riemann surface, Riemann surfaces have a sense of orientation on them. So I know uh, which direction I is moving me, they're oriented. And so around any vertex, I know which order the, the edges are coming are listed as I do say a counterclockwise uh, rotation around my vertex. So we have to give a cyclic ordering to the edges coming out of a, out of a vertex. So there's other combinatorial ways to describe that, but at least for me, that's how I like to think about it. And um, what's true is that also conversely, if you define this combinatorial data, draw any picture that you like, edges of the vertices colored uh, different colors and make sure that you cyclically order your edges, then you have determined a unique belly map up to isomorphism. So this is really an equivalence of categories. So somehow all of the stuff I wrote down about equations and ramification is completely and succinctly encoded in just a picture. So it, like a, uh, a growth and decal also called the design d'enfant. So ch child's drawings, children's drawings. And uh, I, I just say design. And uh, here's an example of what this looks like. Um, just for variety on this slide, I gave a degree four example. Um, and here's the associated design. So you pull this back. Um, you see that the pre-images of zero, which I guess I decided to color black today, um, are one and nine. So you got those labeled. And then there's two roots above one, which are these uh, two quadratic roots. And then you imagine drawing the edges between them. And in this case, there are two edges going like that. And you're supposed to understand this in a sort of pure graph theoretic or topological way where I know which the extra data is just how these uh, edges are, are cyclically oriented around the vertex. So that's truly magical. I hope you'll scribble right now on the sheet of paper in front of you, uh, your favorite stick figure, and then imagine what is the belly map attached to that. Um, that's, that already shows you how accessible and, and uh, sort of is, there's a lot of compression involved in, in saying this is a belly map. Um, so to, to drive that point home, I'll remind you belly maps are defined over number fields. And in fact, every curve over a number field has a belly map on it. Um, so here, although I've uh, only listed ones with entries in Q to, to keep it simple in the slides, a typical one involves algebraic numbers. For example, it could involve a square root of two in its definition. What that means is that, of course, if I have a belly map with root two, Galois theory says the ramification is not going to depend on which embedding of the Q square root two I take. So there's not just this belly map, but all of its Galois conjugates. So that is to say that the absolute Galois group of Q acts faithfully on the set of Dezin. So in those child's pictures, there's secretly some of them labeled with algebraic numbers and a connection between that's provided by the action of Galois on them. So I hope you guys agree that this idea that we can study this in unknowable group, um, the absolute Galois group of Q, just staring at drawings. Um, that's really what uh, uh, Groth and Deke found to be so striking. And I, I, hope, I hope you agree that it is also uh, uh, deep and disconcerting. Now, uh, may, maybe uh, you'll forgive me if uh, I'm also a bit pessimistic on this note. Um, I mean, yeah, it's mysterious and I hope I captured you with the appropriate buzzwords here, but this is really hard. It's really mysterious. 
uh, highly unpredictable and, and really understanding non-trivial Galois invariants is, is still a proto subject. Um, I think we need more data and, or may, maybe it's one of those things that, yeah, there's this action, but what can you really say about it? Um, so I, I stole this picture, which came to me from Ewan Seisling made by Fritz Boykers about a cubic uh, expression. I, I love it because I didn't, I didn't draw it somebody else. Can you, can you see the action of Galois? Uh, maybe you can at least see the fact that this cubic field um, has two, one real embedding and two complex embeddings, and the two on the right here are the complex conjugates. So may, maybe there is something to see here, but you have to draw the pictures in the right way. Um, I don't know, M maybe this is going to remain a tough nut to crack for a while, but at least uh, it was uh, the one of the original big sources of motivation for studying value maps. All right, and then we can further uh, encode this sort of graph theoretic topological property into a pure combinatorial description, which comes from monodromy. So it goes like this, um, a Bell map of degree D uh, up to isomorphism over Q bar is in bijection with transitive permutation triples. So what's a transitive permutation triple? It's a triple of permutations that generates a, a transitive subgroup of SD. Uh, and the only condition that I add for triple is that the product of the three elements is the trivial permutation. Okay, so that's in my definition of, of triple. If you didn't ask for it to be a to generate a transitive subgroup, what you would end up with is disjoint union of, of belly map. And maybe that's a perfectly satisfactory category, but without loss of generality, we can study the connected ones, which are corresponds to transitive subgroups. Um, the sense of isomorphism here is simultaneous conjugation in SD. So if I have a, another permutation tau, I imagine conjugating each of those elements uh, by tau, and I declare those to be equivalent. And then this is uh, an equivalent, forms an equivalence of categories. Uh, what this allows you to see immediately, um, once I explain to you a little bit of where this comes from, is that there's only finitely many uh, uh, isomorphism classes over C or the algebraic numbers of curves with a value map of given degree D. It provides you another way of listing them. Um, uh, on the previous slide, we could draw pictures. And here you just need to list uh, uh, permutations in SD whose product is equal to the identity. That enables you to easily produce lots of value maps of large degree as you like. Um, producing equations is maybe a bit more difficult, um, but at least I hope you feel like you understand this category pretty well. Um, I hope you do. So to be really clear about it, here are the permutations for my original one. Um, and let me explain to you where this, where this comes from. So it comes from monodromy. And uh, so uh, if the, in this association that I uh, declared but haven't yet explained and I'm, I'm about to, um, the, we say phi has monodromy sigma if it comes from this uh, triple of permutations up to, uh, up to equivalence. And then the group that's generated by the triple sigma, I'll call that G inside SD, that's a transitive subgroup. And we call that the monodromy group. Why do we call it a monodromy group? Well, it's, here's where this comes from. It's basic covering space theory from, from algebraic topology. So if you take away the branch points of your cover, so you have a map to P1 minus the, the 0, 1 infinity, the place where it's ramified, this is a legitimate cover in the sense that every, you know, there are no ramification points anymore. What that means is that the, uh, the, this corresponds to a subgroup of pi 1 of P1 minus three points. Okay, and what is, what is P1 minus three points, uh, its fundamental group? Well, that's the free group on two generators um, uh, called gamma zero and gamma one. And that's just because if you pluck away the point zero, one and infinity, you can understand the monodromy by just taking loops around those points uh, oriented in a particular way with the condition that if you loop all of them together, then you can deform that via homotopy. It sort of snaps off the other side of the sphere is the way that I, I think about it. And in this case, you have a conjugacy class of subgroup of index D corresponds to a cover of degree D. And uh, this is how you make your monodromy group. It's by path lifting. So if you take one of these generators, gamma zero, um, choose a point P, which is not equal to zero, one infinity, consider it's D pre-images uh, in the curve X, then by going one loop around zero, you end up with another point in the pre-image and by labeling them one up to D, that gives you a permutation on those D points. 
And the simultaneous conjugation just comes from the fact that you have to label them one up to D, but of course that labeling doesn't matter up to, up to equivalence. So what that tells you is that the cycles of the permutation correspond to the points of X above zero, one and infinity, and the length corresponds to its multiplicity or degree of ramification. So that, uh, I hope that made some sense about, there's a little bit of topology. You get to see the monodromy group acting by inertia and how these permutations act. And this is another way to think about value maps from a more topological point of view. Okay, and the last bit of definition um, that I'd like to make is on passports. Um, uh, so the basic Galois invariants of a Bellu map, you might seek them and they're the, you write down the first ones that you might in order to make some kind of dictionary. Um, so we keep track of, if you have a, uh, first of all, let me define a passport. So a passport is a, the following data. You take a non-negative integer, a transitive permutation group G inside SD, and then three partitions of the integer D. So that's what we define to be a passport. And then if you have a Bellu map, um, its passport is defined to be the genus of the curve X, the monodromy group like I defined two slides ago, and the ramification degrees above zero, one, and infinity. So those are just the lengths of the cycles in sigma zero, one, sigma one, and sigma infinity. Um, I guess we don't include vaccination data on these passports yet, but you, you never know in these, in these times. And the passport of the first example is Gina zero S3 and these partitions. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you might begin to imagine the landscape of belly maps based on this kind of combinatorial organized data. And inside a passport, there will be permutation triples which generate a given group G with certain cycle structure. That's exactly the conjugacy classes in SD. And that's a sort of basic way to understand uh, the Bellu universe. Okay, well, um, so far, if you guys are still with me, and I hope that you are, what, what have we done? Um, well, we defined Belly maps. They're three-point branch covers of P1. Uh, Belly's theorem is that uh, when does a Riemann surface have a Belly map? Well, it's if and only if you can define the Riemann surface by equations with algebraic coefficients. Um, I showed you that there's a lot of ways of thinking about Belly maps. You can imagine equations. You could imagine a graph theoretic version of Dessin by colored graphs equipped with cyclic orientations. You can think about transitive permutation triples or if you like uh, permutation representations of the free group on two generators as a fundamental group. And the deep and disconcerting fact is somehow that there's a natural action of the absolute Galois group of Q on these combinatorial topologically defined sets. Okay, so now um, I pause to see if there are some questions. Zoom is kind of hard. I hope you guys are, are hanging in there. Um, let's take a little break. Does anyone have any questions? Taylor, the partitions keep track of the ramification data. Yeah, that's right. So in the example that I gave here, this two, one, two, one, three just says like above zero, there's gonna be two points one unramified, one ramified, same above one, and then infinity needs to be totally ramified. So in, in, a, in a diagram, it'll look like above zero, I wanna have a point here, which is ramified to degree two and ramified to degree one. So it's just the combinatorial or a way of saying, this is how it will be ramified. So uh, John, in that quote by Grotendieck, he, he talked about the importance of these being modular, are you gonna talk more about that in the second half or, or would this be a good time to ask about it? I will talk about it in the second half. Yeah, you read the gray part, Rachel, which is great. That's <laughs> why I put it there. Um, uh, for those of you who also read it, it's really, it's it uh, here. Uh, can you read the gray, I hope? Uh, could it be true that every projective non-singular algebraic curve defined over number field occurs as a possible modular curve? Wouldn't that be weird? Um, he seemed that it would be so crazy, he was embarrassed uh, to talk to Deline about it. Um, okay, well, yeah, Rachel, I will, I will say, uh, I'll yeah, modular curves are value maps, so I'll, I'll have a slide on that. Okay, uh, do we need any further dance break? Um, I, th I think we're good. I'm going to take my sweater off to indicate that it's about to get serious. Um, I, I hope you feel uh, like you understand 
what a value map is and at least the, what the initial motivation is. But now as a number theorist um, that the, my sweaters come off, we can say, you know, what are they good for? Um, since it may be hard to understand the absolute Galois group this way. All right, so here is the slide for Rachel. I promise we did not uh, secretly uh, collaborate beforehand. But anyway, thanks for the prompt, Rachel. Okay, so I guess we had, we've had some really wonderful talks about modular curves, Galois representations attached to elliptic curves. So if you like modular curves, then actually what you've been studying are certain special kinds of value maps. Okay, so how does this work? So if you take gamma, actually right now, I'll take any finite index subgroup gamma inside SL2Z. You can make the quotient of the completed upper half plane where you allow cusps and you make this quotient X of gamma. So if you just take the J map and if you're fussy like me, you call it capital J, because actually it's ramified above 0, 17, 28 and infinity. And I ask that my value maps be ramified above 0, 1 and, and infinity. Um, uh, so anyway, divide this by 17, 28, then this is a value map. Okay, so why is that? Um, can, I, I guess I should have had a picture or something here to uh, remind you of the number theorist gang sign where we all have draw our SL2Z. That's sort of how we recognize each other on the street. There's, only, there's a few vertices of the triangle and those are the only places where you can have fewer than D distinct pre-images. So you take something in the fundamental domain um, and you consider the finite X subgroup. The group has no stabilizer at that point. The only points with stabilizer are, are I and rho in the fundamental domain corresponding to the elliptic curves with uh, J invariants 0 and 17, 28 with extra CM. And okay, well, however you think about it, that's the only place where this could be ramified because otherwise there are these distinct pre-images. So as long as you move the 1728 to one, you have a value map. So the degree of this value map is just the degree of the, uh, the index of gamma inside SL2Z because that's the number of pre-images. And uh, okay, so um, the deep and disconcerting corollary is that every curve over a number field is a modular curve. Okay, so where, where does this come from? It comes from the fact that uh, uh, gamma of two is the free group on two generators. So it has a, it has a fundamental domain, um, which just has vertices as a sort of an ideal hyperbolic triangle. So where the angles are zero. So it's literally P1 minus three points. So if you believe in the way of thinking about Dezan as being given by finite index subgroups of the free group on two generators, then take this uh, simplest way to describe them, this free two, group, uh, two generators, and then take your finite index subgroup there. So of course, gamma of two sits inside gamma of one with uh, a normal subgroup and quotient S3, and you may prefer it to be inside uh, the that full congruent subgroup. But anyway, at least you get to see the source curve X this way, even though it might have uh, more than one belly map, uh, more than just the one that's defined this way. Okay, so I don't know how to feel about that either, you guys. Is it really fair that every curve over a number field is a modular curve parameterizing elliptic curves with extra structure? Um, that's kind of, that doesn't make any sense. How, how could there, I mean, either we now never can ever hope to understand all curves over number fields because modular curves are hard, or conversely, maybe all along we should be thinking about curves in this way. And then if we could understand what they're parameterizing, then we can understand its rational points. Or I don't know how to, how to wrap my head around the significance of this, but other than to just tell you that it's a thing. And maybe to drive the point home, um, if you take gamma to be gamma zero of two inside SL2Z, SL2Z of index three, you get, a, in, uh, you get the degree three map I started with, uh, two X cubed plus three X squared. That really is the group for gamma zero two. And if you loved the, the talks like I did uh, about elliptic curves, modular parameterizations, you look at all those tables of uh, J maps for uh, in, uh, modular representa Galois representations uh, that occur infinitely often, those are all Bellu maps. Uh, at least once you divide by 1728. So we have already have a large, uh, interesting, compelling list of, of such things. All right, so now that's a congruent subgroup. So it contains gamma of n for some n. What about all the rest of the groups? So actually in any way that you measure it, um, any reasonable way, most finite index subgroups of SL2Z are non-congruence. They don't contain gamma of n for some n. 
And so what is this modular interpretation? What, what does it mean? What level structure are you equipping your elliptic curve with? So there's recent work of Will Chen that gives a moduli interpretation for these non-congruence modular curves using a tyke Mueller level structure. And it's really wonderful and interesting. So somehow, uh, well, I won't say anything about this more. Um, you can click on the blue link or, or follow the, the ones that Drew is posting um, if you would like to read more about that. It's very intriguing, right? This idea that we can understand um, all curves over number fields via belly maps as elliptic curves with extra level structure. Did I answer your question, Rachel? Oh, yes, thank you. And maybe I'll put one other plug in. Um, this works, I don't know, you could run it either way. You can be like, I care about modular curves. They happen to be belly maps. Maybe that gives me something. But maybe if I understand or know how to compute belly maps, it'll tell me something about modular curve. And that's especially useful in situations where it's hard to get equations. Like Elkies has great work um, for computing equations of Shimura curves. And he's not alone. Lots of folks try to use this for their advantage. And then there's also interesting work where you take the universal elliptic curve over that base, uh, in addition to the belly map, and what you end up with are elliptic K3 surfaces. We had a wonderful sequence of uh, talks on K3 surfaces. So certain exceptional ones come from belly maps. They were classified and explicitly given by Boykers and Montanus. And there's, I don't know that that work has been picked up in the same way, but there are lots of adjacent questions, Kalebiao threefolds and other things that would naturally show up in this context. Somehow sort of the minimum amount of ramification and that gives it special properties, but you're still seeing a lot. Uh, John, can I ask a question? Um, sure. So just so here we have a modular curve, we get a Bailey map. But just in general, if you have you know a curve over a number field and you write its Bailey map, what is the the way that you reverse this process? Because the corollary would say that that's in fact a modular curve. How do you see that? Yeah, it's this it's this thing here. Um, I'm sorry, it, it was oh, there. Okay. And then oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So just you look at F two as the fundamental group there, and then you you take whatever finite index quotient, and this is it. Okay. Great. That's it. And that's your okay. And that's, I, I hope it's, it's not exactly what I wrote down here, but it's, it's, it's close enough. You, you could, instead of taking the J map, take the Lambda map, which is the natural coordinate on this, this quotient here. And then that, that really does realize every, uh, every curve. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. It kind of makes sense that you have to rigidify the elliptic curve by fixing where its two torsion is, and then build the structure on top of that. That's sort of uh, a post hoc justification for it being a reasonable one. Okay, um, so right now, uh, I hope that in the first half, you've got a sense of belly maps. What we're going through right now are just like my favorite applications. What makes it fun for number theory? So I hope that you're having fun. Um, the next thing after modular curves that I that gets my heart racing is uh, inverse Galois theory. Boy, that sounded weird. Okay, I, I need to get out more, I guess. Anyway, the inverse Galois problem is an open problem, a hard one. Um, I just taught uh, Galois theory, and even my students asked this kind of question. Does every transitive group occur as a Galois group over Q? We don't know the answer to that. We have some partial progress. And a belly map gives a way to give a partial answer to it. Okay, Instead of trying to realize an individual Galois group, what we do is we make a belly map. And then what is a belly map really? Um, I like to think of, it's a degree D map. So if I think about a pre-image of P1, what I get are D points. The Bellu map is defined over a number field K and its monodromy group is G, then really there's a natural action on this D set of uh, points. Uh, and well, so in other words, a Bellu map is really a family of number fields um, that wants to have Galois group G, okay? And the one at B is because I have to add two um, additional adjectives to it. First of all, it's geometric. So that really only works over C, let's say. We can, when we compute the monodromy, um, we're really computing it topologically. That's something over C. And what that means is when you consider the Galois group over Q, you may, for example, need extra roots of unity or something in order for that monodromy group to be defined. And uh, what that means is that this map X to P1, if you think about it as an extension of function fields, you may need a constant extension inside that geometric extension first, okay? So that will occur in every such Galois group. And so it will be a little bit bigger than the monodromy group G. And then that's also only generically the Galois group G. So that will be true not for every specialization, but it is true for the generic one in the sense of generic polynomials, um, but, uh, uh, 
Oh, I guess I'll say Hilbert irreducibility in a second. Okay, most specializations will have the right Galois group. All right, so um, here are some references if you want to read about uh, how to make Galois groups this way. And the most famous version of this is rational rigidity, which goes back to a breakthrough paper of Thompson, and then many people have picked it up. And what you look for are conjugacy classes in your group that have rational characters and that have a uniqueness property. Up to simultaneous conjugation, there's really only one such triple. And under such combinatorial constraints, you can be sure that the uh, it's defined over Q and with a little bit work, more work you, that the actual Galois group, not just geometrically or generically, but truly the Galois group is the group G that you started with. So uh, for example, the monster group can be realized as a Galois group in this way by using a, a fixed set of, and so there's like a belly, <laughs> a belly map whose monodromy group is the monster group. And no one's written it down. I don't think we can, if that makes any sense to try. But at least we know it exists, and it shows you a way that belly maps can help us to understand Galois groups. Um, so now I'll make my comment about irreducibility. Um, uh, the, the theorem of Hilbert irreducibility says for all t outside of a thin set, which is not something I want to get in now, but think about it as being like the squares um, inside the rational number. So outside of that kind of set, uh, the specialized Galois group is equal to the generic Galois group. So you have, might have to make a finite extension, but on top of that, almost all of the time, 100% of the time, you're gonna get uh, the monodromy group G that you want. And uh, a really fun thing to do with this is to very carefully choose a specialization. So T equals two or something like that. And what you can do is obtain number fields with large Galois group, like Matthew groups, sporadic groups, interesting ones, but constrained ramification. So really just only ramified at two and three or with other uh, small interesting properties. In particular, if you care about an actual number field, maybe you need some equations for your belly map, but after that, you really can plug in t is equal to two. Let me show you what that looks like in an example. So we computed this in a, in a paper, which I think Sam will, will speak about. Um, here is a belly map of degree 50. So it comes about by uh, phi of x uh, equals t. When you clear the denominator, um, you get this polynomial f t of x. So you like imagine c of x equals t. This is the denominator here, five to the tenth c of x to the seventh, with explicitly given polynomials that took us some time to compute. Um, so this is this uh, the the corresponding ratio. Of course, it gives us a belly map, and uh, here are some amazing properties of this polynomial. First of all, its discriminant um, is a power of two, five, and seven and then just t and t minus one. That doesn't always happen for all belly maps, but for nice ones, you really do uh, can significantly constrain the ramification, for example, by saying, I want t and t minus one to only be divisible by certain primes. That's how you constrain the ramification. There is an intermediate extension, this arithmetic subfield of the, of the field, which is q square root minus seven. Um, but the uh, aside from that, the group you get is PSU3F5, which, uh, uh, these are the three by three matrices with entries in F25 with the property that G times the conjugate transpose is equal to one where the conjugate is given by the Frobenius element. I don't know if that's your favorite group. I'm just trying to show you something that's a bit exotic. Um, this group has a nice order and a small permutation representation, which is what makes it possible. And if you plug in T is equal to two and ask what number field you get, you get this uh, slight extension of PSU 3F5 by a Z mod 2Z corresponding to this extension, and it's ramified only at 2, 5, and 7. Okay, so that's how you might approach the Galois problem, uh, inverse Galois problem using families of polynomials. Somehow you leverage geometry to give you a family of them rather than trying to look at things individually. And then by plugging in selectively, you really get to see lots of, of such number fields. And uh, if you want to see more about this, uh, I have links in the here to paper by Hartman Bunyan and by Barth and Vents, where they have con, uh, polynomials for the Conway group, O plus A2. I mean, really interesting, large degree maps um, that allow us access to almost impossibly large Galois groups. Okay. Um, I have a couple more applications. I saw a couple comments in the chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll address those at the end just to make sure I get through uh, this last little bit. Um, I haven't got forgotten about them. Okay, so maybe some arithmetic geometers out there, they just care about curves and you wanna meet some interesting curves when you walk out the door. How do you find 
how do you find the, the gems, the, really, the special ones that have nice properties out there? Well, here's a way, look for Galois belly maps. Okay, so when the belly map itself corresponds to a Galois extension of function fields over C, this is like the difference between a degree five polynomial defining an S5 extension and the degree 120 polynomial defining it that way, okay? So when it's a Galois extension, this has multiple names. So the, the Riemann surface X is sometimes called quasi-platonic. Uh, the reason for this is you're supposed to think of that icosahedral example that I gave earlier, where you imagine it as that's a platonic solid, it's the icosahedron. And these are supposed to be like the Riemann surfaces that are like the platonic solids in the sense that they have this large symmetry group. That's the quasi. And then uh, uh, folks that work in this say their design is said to be regular because of this extra automorphism group of the graph, uh, which you can see from the Galois group of this field extension. Um, if you like moduli of curves, uh, quasi-platonic surfaces are equivalently the curves X, where in the isomorphism class of X in the moduli space of curves of genus G, G greater or equal to two, you ask for this weird numerical function, just it's automorphisms over C. Um, that's a weird looking map, but there are isolated points where it achieves a maximum. Those are necessarily the Galois belly maps. Um, and so these are sometimes also called curves with many automorphisms. Um, they naturally show up as exceptional, interesting zero dimensional point, you know, uh, subsets of MG. So you mean a local maximum? Local maximum, yes, local maximum. Thanks, Bjorn. In a neighborhood, uh, it's it takes a maximum value. Okay, and among everyone's favorites here, I think, uh, are the Hurwitz curve. So uh, Hurwitz proved that the size of the automorphism group of a curve genus G gray or equal to two is bounded above by 84 G minus one. And if the quality holds, if you consider the quotient of X by its automorphism group, the quotient is P1 and it's a belly map. In fact, a special kind of belly map. So already those curves are, are interesting. For example, the Klein quartic, um, here I have a link to Noam's wonderful article on the Klein quartic, has a belly map of degree 168. And it is truly a beautiful thing to behold. Um, there's a nice book by Jones and Wolfart uh, that lists the Galois belly maps according to their genus, genus two. Here I have the list in genus three, and uh, the Klein quartic is down here. Um, here's the Fermat curve. I guess, I don't know why this one's given affinely and this one giving projectively, but anyway. And these are also interesting hyperelliptic or super elliptic cyclic covers of P1. There's also a list in genus four, but hey, if you like this thing, we should, we should compute genus five. They, uh, didn't compute that list yet. And I bet those will be interesting uh, genus five curves uh, because of the presence of many automorphisms. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna do one more topic here and then I will close. Uh, well, we'll see how it goes. So another really famous important application of belly maps is to the ABC conjecture, um, which I don't believe is a theorem. Can we edit that out, Rachel? Um, Okay, I don't know. Uh, so what you can do with a belly map is to specialize even further, okay? So remember these are like polynomials, or at least for P1, they, they, they're, they're, they're rational functions that factor a lot, and when you subtract one, they also factor a lot. So if we plug in for those values, we really should have numbers that when you add them together, they, fact, they all factor a lot. That's, that's what A plus B equals C gives you. So uh, if you go back to that degree 50 example that I had of above and just plug in the first thing that you would try, x equals t equals one, um, you find this kind of thing. So I don't know if you remember, I, I don't wanna uh, circle back, I'll just remind you that sort of there was a fifth power and a seventh power in that expression. And then when I, you subtract it, you get something that's like a square. Um, so after you pull out the common factors of two, you get uh, things that look like this. So this isn't even that great of an ABC triple. Um, but it shows you the idea of how you might make ABC triples or why there should be a relationship between A plus B equals C and, and belly maps. So to make this more precise, uh, Noam proved that by using a belly map on his genus G greater or equal to two curve, you could prove if you know the ABC conjecture, then you know Mordell's theorem. In fact, there are effective versions of it 
that tell you the bound on the height of the curve if you know an effective version of the APC conjecture. Um, and the reason for this is given a genus two curve for which you want to know its rational points, choose a belly map on it, and then use this kind of property where the ABC conjecture would constrain the locations of where the heights of what those rational points would have to be. So you mean the Mordell conjecture or Felting's theorem? Yes, I do. But when you put those together, uh, you get Mordell's theorem, right? Well, I wouldn't say that if I were you. All right, thanks. It's always nice. There's always typos in a talk, and one always gives the blessing that your typos be uh, easy to reconcile. So th thanks, thanks, Bjorn. Okay, and uh, so here's another way in which ABC relates, which I hope will be indicative of uh, the the splendors of a Bell map. So. Uh, one of my favorite things is the ABC theorem for polynomials. That really is a theorem now. Sometimes people call this Mason's theorem or the Mason Stothers theorem. So if you take polynomials, uh, I, I just took them in C for simplicity, whose sum is e uh, F plus G equals H. This is supposed to look like the ABC conjecture. Maybe I have to call it the FGH theorem for polynomials. Anyway, uh, if they're relatively prime, and I don't know, without loss of generality, H has the largest of the, the maximum of the degrees of them, then this degree is bounded by the degree of the radical, which is defined to be the degree where you remove the multiplicities of the factors. So that's a theorem. And the quality holds exactly when the ratio F over G is a rescaled belly map. So somehow belly maps achieve the extreme case of this ABC conjecture, which is the maximum amount of sort of common geometric ramification that is allowed. Somehow this also shows you why when you specialize, you should be expecting something related to the ABC conjecture itself. And one really fun application of this is uh, Hall polynomials. So you may wanna know how close can a cube of a polynomial and a square of a polynomial get sort of how, what's the smallest degree of the difference? And the answer is um, if X has degree 2M and Y has degree 3M so that this common thing has degree 6M, you can get lots and lots of cancellation and the result um, has degree M plus one. So that's extremely small and you can do things like compute these Hall polynomials plug in and that gives you integer cube minus a square for which the difference is a really small integer in absolute value. Okay, um, all right, I'm gonna go through this last slide really fast, just because I think there may be some of you out there who appreciate it, and it really will be my last one. So um, if you take a curve over the algebraic numbers, the Bell-E degree of X is just the minimal degree of a Bell-E map X to P1. So every curve over a number field has a Bell-E map. So you might order all curves over number fields according to the smallest degree of a map that you can get on it. So. Um, this is a weird way to order curves um, until you get used to it. And then it seems like the most natural and interesting way to order curves. Maybe the ones that we saw before where you have Galois value maps that already distinguishes certain curves over others, right? This way you'll see all of them, but ordered according to the smallest degree of the value map. So the value degree behaves like a height. Uh, this is work of uh, Lit Canu. Um, and uh, actually this value degree arises naturally in our Kalof theory. For example, uh, Aryan yavin pekar has shown that you can bound the faulting side of a curve polynomially in terms of the Bell-E degree. So it really does operate like a height in this precise sense, and his bounds are totally effective in that way. His application was to the Edixhoven program, where you compute uh, the coefficients of a modular form in polynomial time. And for that, you kind of need a well-behaved function in terms of height. And so this R. Kalof approach uh, thinking about Bailey degree in this way really helps. And I, I guess I, I'm on this slide because I wanted to show you one theorem that I, that I proved. Uh, this, otherwise, this was just a big survey talk. So here's a little thing that I did that maybe it's not interesting to you, but I thought it was fun. Uh, the Bailey degree of a curve is computable. So that means that if you give me equations as input for a curve with coefficients in some number field, I can run a Turing machine and the output will be the smallest degree of a Bailey map on that curve. So we ran this algorithm on the Fermat curve, which you might remember has a belly map of degree 16, but actually its belly degree is eight. So there's a smaller map there. And if you wanna read about it, um, the link here will take you to our paper. 
Okay. So that kind of ends my talk. So th this was a talk on uh, three point branch covers. I, I hope you enjoy the, they're covered by the branches there and I hope you are feeling relaxed and motivated in your August vacation. Um, I try to convince you that belly maps have a wide range of applications in math, in particular in number theory and algebraic geometry, arithmetic geometry. I'm sorry that I just skimmed the surface of this, um, but I hope that even though I left out numerous applications, um, that will be exactly the right setup for the wonderful lineup that we have to come. So Edre, Oslam, Sam, and Irena will be talking on various topics, computational applications, toroidal maps, dynamical maps, Hurwitz spaces as generalizations. And gosh, uh, y'all, I hope I set up your talks in the right way so that you can start out with a bang. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention.